seven years later to the day, there is an incident in their community where an apparition appeared to them, not just one of them, to the entire group. They said they saw a light flying above them, circling them, and went into the forest. And out of the forest came a beautiful young woman who spoke to them and then went back into the forest and was gone. They prayed for three days and she returned, supposedly, and told them to, you know, live a spiritual life, to follow the doctrine, and don't deviate from it. And they interpreted this as contact with an angel. Now, if it was just one person who had seen it, um, I think it would be pretty easy to dismiss. But according to the historical record, they all were witness to this. Um, is it possible for a group to have a vision? I think so. Is it possible for a group to have some sort of delusional experience? I think it might be. But I'm not trying to judge, you know, whether they saw an angel or not. They believed that they had. They believed that they had been divinely uh, touched somehow. So I think that's, these are just some interesting anecdotes that are part of the historical record. Um, without having seen it ourselves, I don't think we can really know for sure one way or another. And I'm not even sure that would be clear even if we had. Now, uh, so going back, uh, Johann Conrad Beisel, uh, he was inspired when he heard about Johannes Kelpius and his group in Pennsylvania. He was still living in Germany, um, supposedly initiated into a secret Rosicrucian fraternity, um, and then as a result whether he slipped up and said something he shouldn't have or whatnot, he was persecuted. I think he ended up losing his job. He had to flee to another city. Um, I think by trade, originally, he was a baker. Anyway, he's inspired. Hearing of Kelpius, he decides, I'm going to go join that group and live in the wilderness and wait for the second coming. You know, These guys are doing it. Um, I'm going to follow suit. So he and, and a few friends get on a ship, and they show up in Pennsylvania. Lo and behold, Kelpius has died years ago, and the community is no longer there. So I think initially he was probably pretty heartbroken, but for whatever reason, he decided, well, just because Kelpius' community is no longer here doesn't mean that we can't establish something similar to what he had. So he does, and they established Ephrata Cloister, which uh, is still a historic uh, monument uh, there today, uh, the, the ruins of it anyway. I don't know how good a shape it's in at this point. But there were a number of Kelpius' original band who were in the area who joined up with Bysel. So this is also a sort of a semi-monastic community, but they also had members who were married, who had families and children, and then uh, you had the sort of elect, or if you will, who were monastic, men and women. They were separated, of course, or they tried to be most of the time, and uh, live according to the doctrine that Beisel laid out for them. This included diet, strict dietary guidelines, um, no milk, very little meat, no beans, things of this nature. Um, Beisel was very concerned with sacred music. They had a chorus uh, that would perform, and he thought it was imperative that in order to be a member of this chorus that you were a member of the strict monastic celibate community. Of course, no sex, you know, because that would affect the voice too. Uh, the special diet 
and um, their music has been called uh, heavenly, um, transformational, uh, inspired, religious, and was heard by a lot of people at the time, and they were deeply, deeply moved by it. Um, in addition, I think it's notable that uh, the men of this monastic community and, and the strict uh, celibates formed their own group. They called the Brotherhood of Zion. They built their own temple. They had their own alchemical lab. In order to be initiated into this group, you'd be sent out into the wilderness, and every so often they would give you some alchemical medicine to purify you. Um, they practiced Egyptian Freemasonry and theurgy. They were involved in summoning angels, in contacting the spiritual realms, and this went on for a number of years. Uh, eventually, Beisel was kind of pushed out aside as the leader inside this smaller group. And uh, I think the leaders were men who had originally come over with Johannes Kelpius. Um, the women formed their own sisterhood, um, the Rose of Sharon. And uh, they followed a similar type of practices. There was no Freemasonry or alchemy, but there was a lot of meditation, obviously the strict diet uh, guidelines. Um, now, of course, uh, a lot of this was uh, idealistic um, and utopian, as I mentioned, one of the hallmarks of Rosicrucianism. Uh, and it didn't always work the way that it was supposed to. There was fraternization between some of the men and women. Uh, Beisel was accused of sleeping with one or more of the women at times, of drinking too much wine, and so on and so forth. Um, there was some discontent. But for the most part, this is an example of a Protestant semi-monastic community in America. It's n never been done here. It's never been done anywhere before. Um, and one of the really interesting events that happened, and, I, and this goes back to the idea of healing and healing for free, is during the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Brandywine took place very close to Ephrata Cloister. I'm not sure exactly how far. But the uh, General Washington and his commanders, uh, this was winter time. They didn't really know what to do with their wounded and the sick. Um, and they decided, let's take them to Ephrata Cloister. Because they were friends with Peter Miller, who had succeeded Johann Conrad Beisel at the time. They personally knew him. Uh, one of the reasons they knew him is Ephrata Cloister had a printing press, which I didn't mention in the paper, but I think that's kind of uh, analogous with the original Rosicrucian movement because uh, it, these manifestos were printed and distributed. And this printing press at Ephrata Cloister, if it wasn't the first in this country, it was one of the first. And so, while they were pacifists, they were very sympathetic to the ideas of the revolution because they were interested in a reformation of society. They weren't going to participate themselves, but when it came to caring for the wounded and the sick, they were more than happy to do so and even sacrifice their own health in order to do so and had no problems with it. And the soldiers who they cared for were deeply touched by the fact that they cared more about, they cared more for their patients than they did for their own safety and health. So I think that's a good example of healing. And obviously, they did not charge them any money for this. And they were happy to help out. So again, I think we can say that 
at least in that sense, they match up very well with this, all of these landmarks of Rosicrucianism that we can find. Healing the sick for free, sacred music, the use of the symbolism, the Gnostic theosophy, the use of Kabbalism, the imagery, you know, all of these ideas. They, to me, it's, I wouldn't say it's clear cut, but there's, there's enough there that I think you can draw the analogy. Um, one of the other interesting things is their relationship with the Native American communities nearby. Uh, most Christians um, were intent on converting the savages to Christianity and to save their souls. Kelpius, his followers, and subsequently Ephrata Cloister, they had no interest in converting them. They recognized that they had their own religion and spirituality, and somehow they recognized the value of it and could even find similarities in some of the ideas, which I think is fascinating to me, because to me that says they're not really fundamentalists at all, that they're not trying to convert these people. They recognize that they have their own culture, their own spirituality, and they're free to do so. And they embrace the fact that people have the freedom to do so. I think, you know, that that's notable. Um, So, through this analysis, my conclusion is really that, that all of these beliefs and practices and, and the historical evidence says to me that they're connected with the ideas and beliefs and practices of what we think of as Rosicrucian. Were they really Rosicrucian? I don't know, but I think if you put a gun to my head, I'd say, yeah, they were. <laughs> I know that's controversial, and um, I understand that. I don't mean to offend anyone by saying that they were. Um, but as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, ancient mystic order of the Rose Cross, Amork, has a lodge in Boston, and the lodge is named Johannes Kelpius Lodge. So Amork, which is publicly a modern... Rosicrucian-inspired group recognizes these esotericists as Rosicrucian. Now, would I say they were all Rosicrucian? Probably not. But Kelpius? I would say yes. Bisol? Probably. Did they always act in a manner that could be construed as Rosicrucian? Maybe not. Does any human being know? That's debatable. But that's essentially uh, my presentation, and, and I hope uh, you have some questions. Before we, yeah, before sure. we turn over the floor to questions, if I, if I may, uh, I just want to remind folks that if we don't have your information, And also, um, in order to help us um, have the space for meetings like this, um, have other speakers come in and do other things that we want to do to people, um, I'm going to pass this around and ask, ask for your help. Uh, and can you, would you, um, sorry to interrupt you, but I don't know. I have a question. Um, what became of the Ephraim Blister community? Um, well, since the core group was not interested in having children, eventually it kind of petered out. That'll catch up with you. No, they didn't go the route of the Shakers? Well, essentially, yeah. Well, the Shakers left the community by, by doing um, orphanages. 
Yeah, I think it. I think it lasted into the 1800s. I don't know the you know the exact end date. I, I don't know that there is an exact end date. Um, I think it may have. Yeah, I did some pictures of the toys here online, and it looked in fairly good shape, and they were more recent pictures. I've heard that it's it not in as good shape now as it oh, had been, but that could be wrong. I haven't not been there myself yet. I would like to, but. Uh, two questions. One um, about the music at uh, at Prada uh, has has that survived? Either obviously not in recorded form, but is there uh, a, a written survival of what that music and, uh, and have people yeah. done anything with it? And also, you mentioned that the men practice a form of Egyptian rite uh, Freemasonry. I was wondering what rite in particular that was, if you know. Yeah. For uh, the regards to the music. Um, the example that I heard uh, was a modern recording, obviously, of the music, and it was available uh, on the same website where Jan Stries' paper about article about uh, alchemy of the voice is, and I think it was published as, um, I forget the name of the journal, but it's uh, Western Michigan University, I believe. Um, Hang on, I, I have it right here. Hang on a second. Okay, we'll put a link on the show notes. Can we do that, Father? Yeah, let's just kind of ask that. Esoterica is the name of it. It's available at esoteric.msu.edu slash alchemy. Yeah, I'm going to put the link on the comments. Here. I heard you guys are recording you saying. Okay. Mr. Tom University. Yeah. So, and they have they have an audio file uh, linked up to that. Um, if if you can't get the audio for some reason, just let me know. I did. Yeah. I I, I actually extracted it as an MP3 and tried to clean it up a little bit because I I did a recording of some remarks on the paper and I used that as like the ending music. Oh, I wish I, I wish I could. My voice isn't that good. <laughs> um, with regard to the Egyptian Freemasonry, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, it was not the strict Egyptian rite of Cagliostro. It was the later uh, rite of Memphis before it was merged with the rite of Mitzrayim. Yeah, and of course, uh, Egyptian Freemasonry is uh, highly esoteric, symbolic, and involves the practice of theurgy and alchemy. Uh, and it's fascinating to me because you know they had this octagonal temple, octagonal shaped temple. Uh, they practiced their Freemasonic rites. They had their uh, alchemical laboratory. I don't know if it was located in the temple or nearby. And uh, interestingly, too, there was a gentleman, I uh, forget his name now, let me find it very quickly. There's a just, it was a student of, uh, here we go, in 1762, Jacob Martin. A high philosopher arrived at Ephrata, a follower of Michael Sendegovius, for anybody who's into alchemy, know that name. He brought with him many alchemical manuscripts and processes and built a laboratory near the Ephrata community seeking the red tincture of Sendegovius with which Sendegovius had reputedly transmuted lead into 120,000 dollars of gold and created the Lapis Philosophorum or Philosopher's Stone. See, there's a fundraising idea for Let's get on that. <laughs> yeah. So, I, again, the, the fact that a, a student of Sendegovius shows up in 1762 uh, prepared to, you know, try to make the Philosopher's Stone, I think, is... And that, that wasn't, like, an easy trip. No. Not an easy trip, especially with all that glassware that's so fragile yeah. and so expensive. Yeah. So, 
where, where, where is the file located, or where was it located? Uh, uh, yeah. Is it Lancaster? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's very, very close to Lancaster. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots of Amish Oh, yeah. And did they arrive? Was, they it, was this arrival happening at the same time that the Amish and Mennonites would show up? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Which is you, you can have land of your own, you can work it as you Which is why Pennsylvania is, is so German. Yes. It's not because Pennsylvania is the most tolerant, it's very tolerant, but right the Rhode Island is just as tolerant. That's true. So yeah. Right. And up in Massachusetts they were burning Quakers in the state. <laughs> Any, so and you didn't mention mm -hmm. that Julian, is it Julian or Julius? It's Oxy. Julius, yeah. He, uh, he, uh, what, what, what Bach points out, he, he, he uh, embellished stuff. He kept the falsified stuff oh. to support his Rosicrucian ideas. I have no fixed opinion about it. I think that's probably the case um, that he probably did embellish and uh, as I said I think he had a personal bias that he he saw himself as a descendant whether really or philosophically of these groups and he wanted to believe they were Rosicrucian. Dr. Soxe I believe was a Freemason. Uh, Dr. Soxe had his own esoteric uh, lineage and that he may have wanted to embellish, and, and I think in the same way that A.E. Waite and Manley Hall wanted to say, no, 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 they're not, they're not Rosicrucian. Um, that's why I find so much value in Arthur Versalis's work, because he says, I don't, it doesn't really matter whether they were or not. Let's look at who they were, what they did. We'll look at the evidence and see what people wrote about them, and and see what the historical record shows. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely arguing that, as far as I can tell, the beliefs and practices were the same or so similar to what we think of as Rosicrucian that even if Soxe embellished or falsified, um, he probably had good reason to do so, which sounds horrible, I know, but... Uh, Yeah, that's my that's my personal thought on that. That he probably did embellish and falsify, but he believed he had the proper reason to do it because they they were in his eyes. Now I think it's interesting about the uh, especially because he says uh, Johann Beisel was actually initiated into a secret fraternity. Did he? that he was actually initiated into the Rosicrucian fraternity in Germany. Now, if it's really a secret Rosicrucian fraternity, how in the world would Soxe have known that? <laughs> did, what, did someone tell him that? I mean, in his book, he's, he, he, he's a historian, but he's not an academic, and he certainly doesn't provide any kind of proof to back up there's his no, statements. There's no, there's no footnote. His book is self-published. Um, you know, again, this is uh, late 1800s, I think, so... You know, and who was he writing for? I think that's something we also have to think about. Dr. Soxe was the president of the German Historical Society in eastern Pennsylvania. He's writing for other descendants of German settlers in Pennsylvania. He's not writing for a university. 
he's not writing to challenge uh, Manly Hall or anything. He's uh, preaching to the choir. Exactly, yeah. And according, I think, to the descendants and based on the fact that they had this text, I would have probably drawn the exact same conclusion. You know, if I was not writing an academic paper, I would have said, yeah, they were, they seem to have been Rosicrucian. As an academic paper, I can't say that. All I can say is uh, it seems like their beliefs and practices were so similar as to be remarkable, to be notable, and that we should probably not discount them. And I think there's some other uh, interesting points that we can that we can make about this. Uh, the first is uh, why why do some people want to say that uh, these groups are not esoteric? Well, I think um, primarily because they were open about what they believed and what they practiced to a great extent. People who are traditional esotericists would never ever be open and practice or profess their beliefs to anyone outside of their own group. Uh, not, uh, not, certainly not in those days. Nowadays, it might be a different story. Back then, forget it. You know. So maybe that's one reason why people want to say they weren't really esoteric. They didn't, they didn't maintain that hermetic seal around their own group. If everybody knew they, you know, that they practiced these things, that they believed it, they demonstrated it with public performances of their music, you know, that, are they really esoteric? Well, to me they are, but uh, I could see how you could argue that by being open about it, that's not really esoteric. Okay, I can, I can accept that. Um, they did. They did.